Okay, so after all that, I am Lori Gimmel Arp. I'm the director at DuraSpace Community Supported Programs at Lyricis. And Melissa had asked us to talk about kind of what comes next and how we in the Island Dora and Fedora communities go forward, how we build and validate roadmaps. Um, you probably saw David Wilcox. He's the program manager for Fedora. He spoke earlier today and is now officially on vacation. So I'm happy to talk about Fedora and how we have and continue to work to make sure we're moving forward with the community as we go forward with Fedora. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about building that roadmap. So we'll talk about designing the migration path grant, achieving alignment with governance and community outreach. So first, designing a migration path. So as some of you in the community are probably you know, already aware of, the issue that we were finding with Fedora is that a lot of folks are using earlier not supported versions, um, 3x and earlier. And there's lots of risks to that, as, as you're probably well aware. But the biggest one is once software is no longer supported, that means if bugs come up, if security issues come up, and you're using those, that that's not good. We're not able to go back and fix those once they're not supported, so you're really leaving yourself vulnerable. And we found that migrations to 4.0 and newer have really been challenging. 3 to 4 itself was a, a heavy lift. And uh, Fedora has been around for a while. Sorry, getting notices. I'm going to ignore that and assume that somebody else can handle it. So we did know anecdotally of barriers to migration, but we really wanted to get um, data so we can build a roadmap. The last thing we wanted to do is hear an individual story and assume all issues are similar to that one. Really wanted to make sure that we were addressing lots of different institutions and making sure whatever solutions we proposed and implemented were gonna work for the larger community. So in terms of assessing barriers to migration, IMLS um, funded a grant, we were very pleased about this, in 2018 to investigate barriers to migration. It's really focused on assessment and recommendations, and the work itself was completed in August 2019. In terms of deliverables, the first part was investigation, really doing an environmental scan, looking at all the literature, um, so we were well aware of everything that was going on then doing institutional profiles. We picked eight and really trying to get a, a wide range of data profiles that were samples of the larger community. So we were trying to look at lots of different things. Also reviewed migration tools, the Fedora API, OCLF, OCFL. Um, and then the real meat of the, of the work was the evaluation. This is where I say we, but I wasn't involved at the time. So again, David gets all the credit for this and working with the larger community, but they spent a lot of time working on the evaluation, conducted a community survey from April to May in 2019, and then really dug into the results and the analysis and gathered 111 different responses. So the survey was trying to really target the barriers to migrating Fedora 4.0 or 4.x. Um, and the biggest, uh, I don't want to say winner. <laughs> the biggest constituency, uh, nearly 50%, 48.5, was insufficient, insufficient time, staff, or resources. Just the capacity in terms of staff and time to make these very substantial changes. Uh, the API, rewriting interactions, all of it was, it, it's just a big ask. Um, another big answer, 44.7%. Uh, cited lack of compatibility with front-end applications. And nearly 40% talked about the change in metadata standards for descriptions. So, um, you know, how do you map existing metadata with all these changes? And then also still a, a substantial um, issue, 33% reported issues with performance and scale. The migration itself was slow. So in terms of moving data, this is another anecdotal thing, but one institution, a large institution had a million objects in Fedora and to move it, it took months and then failed. <laughs> and so it couldn't be completed, which is a disappointing and frustrating issue. We found that a lot of the smaller migrations were easier, but the larger ones just had a lot of issues. And just anecdotally, we are working on 6.0 right now and we have tested that same one that had a million objects and it took a week to migrate and it did go successfully. So 
just to point out, we make sure to address those. Um, there is a migration path report on the wiki that I'm happy to link to later. Um, so if you want to dig into all the results of that, you're, we're happy to share that. So we also uh, did a survey trying to get a sense of what would help. It's one thing to identify the problems, which is important, but then also digging into what would help. And so um, a little over 70% said content migration tools. A slightly second place, 61.4% said metadata migration tools. And over 50%, 52.3% said documentation. So after that survey, which was great, we really wanted to dig in. You don't want to think like, oh, they need documentation and have in your mind what documentation is and find out that's not what most of the people answering the survey thought. So followed up with the subset of the survey who said that they would be interested in talking with us further to really sharpen our understanding. And one of the things that, that became clear is it wasn't obvious that everyone was going to go to migrate and particularly to six, which is Fedora six is the one we're working on now. It was clear in the focus group that if it was too challenging, a lot of those earlier people implementing earlier versions might not migrate at all, or I don't know, worse, but also equally problematic is that they would move to a different system altogether. So the, the working with the folks in the folk, folks in the focus group, things they talked about were the need for community best practices for data models, um, that labor intensive migration is a decision point, that people really need a compelling reason to do that migration if it's a lot of work. Um, OCFL back to Fedora 6 is compelling and makes migration easier. And David talked about this in his session earlier today. So if you're really dying to know more about OCFL, he gave lots of good data and happy to point to that recording or I'm sure he'd be happy to talk further about it. And they also always also agreed in the focus group that the security risks of staying on 3.0 or earlier were a real concern to them as well. So we took the survey data and the focus group and tried to really focus on recommendations for going forward. And the two main elements that came up were the focus on effort and value. So the level of effort an institution would need compared to the perceived value. So for example, if something required lots of effort, it wasn't that they wouldn't do it, it's just that they would have to have a really substantial perceived value in order to make that effort worthwhile. So the recommendations were really focused on things that if it was high effort, it really needed to have high value, otherwise it wouldn't go forward. So number one, de developing and delivering Fedora 6.0 with OCFL. Number two recommendation was developing migration tools. Three, testing Fedora 6 at scale, making sure, I think David kind of alluded to this this morning as well, making sure that we didn't deliver something that wasn't thoroughly tested by lots of elements in the community to make sure it was really going to meet the needs. And documenting, um, documentation, having case studies, data models, and best practices. And just as an aside, this session, as Melissa asked us to do, is really focused on the future and how we work with the community to create roadmaps. But I feel compelled to mention that all this great feedback from the, the grant has led to our current grant proposal with IMLS, um, which we're awaiting word on any moments, hopefully in July, we will hear good news that it will be funded. But if it is funded, that will provide migration paths and tools. So documentation, case studies, best practices to support and improve migration processes for those Fedora 3 repositories and a migration camp as well. So we're really hoping to hear good news from ILS soon. So did lots of work with focus groups and the survey, made recommendations. That's all great, but that's in a vacuum. You really need to make sure that we're connecting that great feedback with the groups that have to implement and care about it. So the next step is aligning that, those goals and recommendations with governance. With Fedora, we have uh, a governance group that really is responsible for the overall strategic plan and the core committers they're responsible for the technical roadmap and doing the, the development work and, and aligning that. So sharing those recommendations with each of those groups and then also quarterly, the leaders and committers have calls to make sure exactly that, um, not just for these recommendations, but always with Fedora, making sure that leadership that might be representing different parts of the organizations are aligning with the technical folks who are actually gonna do the work and making sure they're all on the same page. So we're not in parallel lines or 
that we're aligned. The other hugely important part is that is the larger community, making sure that they're aware and engaged and that this answer, is, these solutions will work for them. So we really strive, and David is great about this, in working with the community for transparency and engagement. And I know all of us who work with the communities feel like sometimes we're repeating ourselves all the time, but that's really the deal. Like you're, we're gonna be clear and repeat multiple times in multiple ways, making sure that we're reaching our audience wherever they are. So for example, the technical roadmap is published on the wiki. So if somebody's interested specifically in when a feature or functionality is gonna be done and how the roadmap is there. Plans are also communicated through conference presentations, newsletters, blog posts. So anybody who's just generally interested, um, we're trying to make sure that they have lots of ways, however they wanna hear about it. Uh, we have been engaged with pilot partners, really making sure that we're testing everything very thoroughly and that they're different groups. Right now we have three different pilot partners, uh, National Library of Medicine, University of Wisconsin-Madison, and DocuTeam Switzerland. And again, I'll help you notice that those are all kind of different organizations. So making sure that we're not just thinking of one kind of audience, but different kinds of use cases. And that there are lots of channels for community feedback as well. Always trying to make sure that people know where we are with the process and getting feedback earlier and earlier rather than waiting till the end. And if you're just in the pilots, there's also some information on the wiki about that, which I can share a link to later. I cannot have a Fedora presentation without mentioning the members because they're the the ones who make it possible for us to support the larger community. Um, this nice this nice image shows all the different logos. Um, this last year we had 69 different members who contribute financially to the greater um, community and making sure that there's a program that we can continue to provide Fedora with. And then resources, always want to share lots of ways to work with us. You can always subscribe to the mailing list, uh, participate in a code sprint, join the conversation on Slack or support us by becoming a member. That's always particularly welcome. I'm happy to take any questions you have now. And I think also we might have time for questions at the end of this session if you have them then. But if people have questions, I can, it might be best if Melissa reads them out because I can't see the chat when I'm sharing my screen. Nothing in the chat at the moment. Well, there'll be a test at the end, so make sure that you ask any questions at the end. And I'm going to stop sharing. How's that looking? Do you see the big pink and orange slide? Hopefully you do. It looks good. Okay, then let's see. I will try captions now. Looks like it might be working. Okay. Bear with us. <laughs> Hopefully we've got this right. So I am good. I am Francesca Baird and I'm presenting together with Natalie Shilstedt. We'll spend about the next 10 minutes or so just briefly introducing some work that the Islandora Collaboration Group engaged in this past winter and spring. I'm going to give you a little background. Natalie will talk about the survey we did and the results we received. And if there's time, I'll wrap up with a brief mention of what we've started working on as a result of that survey. Um, the outcome of that survey. There hopefully will be a little time at the end for questions, but if not, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat or you can always write to Natalie and I. So that's our mission statement. You've probably heard of us by this point, but just in case, um, the ICG is an inclusive community of practice that advocates for community use cases, contributes shared codes such as ISLE and LASER to help expand Islandora use and conducts a few friendly low key hack docs each year. We seek opportunities to strengthen Islandora's sustainability through community engagement and working to build our ecosystem of developers and documenters. We, that's a list of our current membership. We have about 15 member institutions plus a few consortial members and additional affiliates. We meet monthly by Zoom and have been for years, so we're old hat at this. And we use Slack to expedite communication, especially amongst project steering committees. We collect dues and we pay nearly all of our dues forward to be members to, for, to the foundation um, in order to have representation on the board of directors, the coordinating committee, and the technical advisory group. 
We have worked on and or sponsored development for several projects collectively, most recently Isle. You've already heard quite a bit about it, so I won't bore you with more. Um, and Laser, which was a project to develop a suite of IR institutional repository features within Island or 7. As these projects are coming to a close and or have moved on to bigger and better things, we saw a need as a community to figure out our own next steps as a group and, and what we might want to turn our focus to. So at the beginning of this year, um, we really got into thinking about this kind of future direction, especially as Isle and Laser concluded or moved on. And also our membership was growing. So we wanted to take a step back, ensure that our members were still benefiting as much as possible from being a part of the group. And also we knew that the majority of our membership currently uses I-7 in production and we're facing impending migrations to Islandora 8. So we wanted to determine how best we could support each other in our migration efforts. We decided to develop a survey with the goal of assessing both our strengths and challenges as a growing organization, and as well as the kind of Islandora I-8 related projects we should prioritize and shift our focus to. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Natalie to talk in more detail about the survey. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? It looks like the captions are picking up, okay. So um, the ICG governance group developed the survey based on these 10 topics that the steering committee had frequently discussed in our monthly meetings. In the survey, we asked members to rate their level of interest in each of the 10 predetermined topic areas from one to five. And each rating was followed by a question that allowed for free text elaboration on each topic. And these free text responses ended up being especially helpful in illuminating members' specific concerns, interests, and questions related to each topic. We received a total of 26 responses with at least one response from each ICG member institution. The ICG governance group then ranked the level of interest in each topic, and that ranking is represented in the slide with um, documentation and workflow sharing ranking the highest and resources for employment and hiring ranking the lowest. Um, and as we began reviewing the comments that were made, it became clear that there was a lot of overlap in the interpretation of the topics. For example, with migration workflows and metadata for Island Dora 8 being closely connected and frequently discussed together in the comments, and the first four topics were also very close in the rankings with only a few percentage points of difference. So next I'm going to briefly go over some of the key takeaways from each of these topic areas. Under documentation and workflow sharing, many members called out the need for clear and detailed documentation for Island Dora 8 installation migration, maintenance, customization, and metadata workflows, and that not having this kind of documentation in place would be a significant barrier to implementation. Many of our institutions are dealing with budget and staff cuts that were happening even before the pandemic began, and we should assume that we will need to get by without as much vendor support, making documentation all the more important. In addition to having more official Islandora Foundation produce documentation for Islandora, ICG members feel that it will be important for institutions to collaborate and be willing to share their institution specific documentation with one another and also collaborate on the creation and improvement of existing documentation. In terms of other specific topics that were referenced under the documentation question, members expressed interest in a wide range of things, including server infrastructure and storage expansions, workflows for system integration, bulk ingest workflows, navigating the user interface, and troubleshooting. Other members also raised concerns about the quickly evolving nature of Island Dora 8 and its associated um, migration tools as being a potential barrier to the creation of good documentation at this time. As previously mentioned, the migration workflows and metadata for Island Dora 8 topics were frequently discussed 
together in the survey comments. And metadata surfaced as a top concern within the context of migration. Several members called out a need to engage in test or pilot migration projects, actually trying out the various migration tools that exist, documenting the results and finding gaps in the existing documentation. There was concern that the Islandora Foundation's migration toolkit would only work for simple metadata and needs to be tested with more complex metadata examples. Trying out some test migrations with real data would also help um, answer the question of how much and what kind of metadata remediation would be necessary to complete prior to migration. There was also interest in developing shared metadata standards for the Islandora community, as well as a migration project plan and timeline that could serve as a framework for approaching a migration project. Institutional repository functionality also emerged as a high priority for most ICG schools. Several of the ICG schools are already using Islandora as an IR via Laser or Islandora Scholar, or are interested in migrating IR content from systems like Depress Visual Commons to Islandora. Other members are strongly considering using Islandora for scholarship in the near future in an effort to consolidate systems and cut costs. Since Laser was developed to mimic some depressed functionality, members also want assurances that there will be feature parity in Islandora 8. Matomo usage statistics and Google Scholar tags um, were called out specifically as being a high priority. Documented migration workflows from Depress and other IR systems to Islandora were also requested. The point was also made that IR functionality in Islandora 8 would increase the adoption of Islandora and help to further grow the community. Many institutions are also interested in expanding and improving the preservation features in Islandora 8, but there was a general lack of clarity about what preservation functionality Fedora 6 and the Oxford Commons file layout would provide and what kind of preservation feature parity already exists between Islandora 7 and Islandora 8. For example, with fixity checking and the compatibility of the Bagot module. It was suggested that some Drupal modules could potentially provide some preservation functionality and that should also be investigated. For institutions that are currently using or planning to use dedicated preservation systems like Archivematica, and Preservica, there was interest in improving Islandora's integrations with these systems. As a topic in the survey, integrations ranked low compared to preservation features. It was nine out of 10 versus five out of 10. Um, the comments made under the integrations topic frequently called out archive space as being a highly desirable integration because many of the ICG schools are currently using a space. Because the cost of developing a new custom theme for Islandora 8 would be a barrier to migration for most of the ICG schools, the ICG raised this idea of cost sharing and collaborating on the development of a shared Drupal 8 theme as a potential solution. In the survey results, several members expressed that collaborating on a shared theme would also help us ensure the availability of needed features like accessibility features and speed up our migration timeline. Several members also expressed that in light of budget and staff constraints that the theme should be easily maintained without a lot of vendor support. This question about handling audiovisual content in Islandora 8 was intentionally left very vague in the survey and the responses showed a variety of interpretations of the topic. There was generally some confusion in the responses since Islandora 8 does currently handle and display audio and video content via Drupal. There were also several references to the importance of having something like the oral history solution pack to display oral history content with caption functionality and a general desire to improve performance and server storage issues caused by 
growing collections of very large audio and video files, perhaps by utilizing a remote streaming server. In the survey comments about the accessibility of Island Dora 8, several members pointed out that Drupal 8 has native accessibility features, but there was a lack of clarity about whether those features actually meet the requirements of WCAG or the web content accessibility guidelines. It was also pointed out that Islandora includes third-party modules, plugins, and viewers that are maintained outside of the Islandora community. So it would be important to reach out and collaborate, collaborate with those maintainers to ensure a truly accessible site. While um, accessibility ranked relatively low in the survey, several members expressed a lot of enthusiasm about the topic, stating that accessibility should not be considered a trend or as meeting a particular community's needs, but rather as improving use for all, and that accessibility is important to the longevity and appeal of Island Dora 8 to a broader community. The need for training and employment resources surfaced as an issue within the ICG because many institutions do not have the capacity to hire on-site developers. And for others, it is difficult to find employees with Island or related experience and skills. Suggestions that emerged were developing a list of required skills for maintaining Islandora as both an administrator or a developer, sharing of resources and professional development opportunities for building skills, and increasing awareness of job postings for Islandora related positions. There were also comments about how we should invest in building the skills of our current staff and supporting and encouraging BIPOC developers digital library professionals and students who are interested in doing this work. So I will now turn it back over to Francesca who will talk about some of the next steps the ICG is taking. Thanks, Natalie. Um, I'm just gonna be very brief because I'm aware of time. Just to say that uh, we're already starting to unpack, as Natalie has mentioned, there was quite a bit in those results and we're already starting to think about ways that we can um, adopt some of those questions and attitudes. And some of the ways we're trying to do that is really firm up and um, concretize our connections to the bigger community and the foundation. So while we had already paid for membership to the board, uh, membership to the IF and so that we could sit at the board tag and ICC, we weren't always consistent about having members there. We're trying to be more consistent about that and also bringing those members into our governance group so that we have communication, hopefully, feeding into our group from the foundation and the larger community and also so that we can um, get communication out from ICG uh, in a better, more seamless way. We are we have a metadata working group that has already been working for a while on metadata for, I for Islandora 8 and partnering with the MIG, I believe. We've added Lisa McFall, who is the chair for that group, to our governance group, again, to build out that communication. And that metadata group is now sort of branching out. They're looking at migration tools, investigating those, and also building a timeline for a migration path for folks. Uh, and finally, and, and really the largest one that I think we'll be working on for a while is sort of um, unpacking and thinking about our own internal structure, our communication, how we are transparent, how we conduct the business of an organization, but really um, prioritize time and space for networking amongst our members, for skill sharing, and you know, addressing topics of interest. So we're working on those things. Details are coming, but that's, that's what we're kind of starting with, those three top ones internally. So thank you for listening. Thank you for being part. Natalie and I are happy to take questions, probably not right now, because it's time to move on to Danny's presentation. And there are some links there in case you want to learn more or reach out to us. Thank you. And I will stop sharing now. Hey, all right, we got that from captions. All right. <clears throat> so, all right, uh, my part of the panel here, uh, we've called creating a feedback loop with the community, uh, which is really what we're trying to do, what we've been trying to do since really the onset of the Allendora Foundation. Um, 
you know, creating that feedback loop, it's, it's critical. People need to tell us what they want so that we know how to make what they want. And then when we can implement that, then they can look at it and tell us what works and what doesn't work. And we can just keep iterating on this process and making the software better and better. I mean, that's, that's it. If you get a community of only users and no developers, then it gets, you know, really hard, right? So we're just trying to make sure that we kind of just make sure all the gears are greased and working and so that you know end users and librarians and developers are all like working together and on the same page and that there's uh, a gentle guiding hand from the if making sure that all of this all of this happens so and and this process really um played out spectacularly well when we went from our initial release of i wonder 8 to the 1.1.0 release so in general, you know, I will just start by saying this, um, I, you know, other than like my usual buzzwords like microservices and lowering technical debt, this is one you'll hear me repeat often. Um, common need drives development, like straight up, you know, um, people don't do this because uh, they're nice or they like us or me or something, right? They're doing this because um, they have a real need for their organization or their institution and other people have that same need. And so if we can just get together and do it all together, then everyone, it lowers the barrier to entry for everyone, right? And so so straight up, what gets done versus what doesn't get done, that is decided by common need, okay? But there is a very natural tendency to build silos. So even though two organizations have roughly the same needs, they will very often, unless there's some kind of coaxing, they'll just end up building two very similar silos right next to each other. And that's bad. Right? We're, we're at the foundation, we're trying to prevent that. We're trying to destroy the silos and break them down so that we all essentially share the same single tool. And so, ooh, that's not coming out very well on my screen here with the pink, but surveying highlights the common need. So like surveying is the tool that we're using to break down those silos. If we know what everyone wants, then we can run around and like, you know, wave it around and stuff like that and start to get people's attention and be like, hey, you said you need this, you need this too, right? And we can, we can start to, to do the people work that's involved. So the surveying is, is super duper important for us at the foundation. And when we did a survey to find out what features people wanted for 1.1.0, uh, I'll just say, uh, first off, I love it when you look for some clip art or a stock photo and it just lines up directly with your exact phrase. Here I'm saying the stars align for 1.1.0. I love the fact that it's like such a direct <laughs> metaphor with that picture. Um, but really, you know, we had done surveys before, surveys like, do you want to use Slack instead of IRC and stuff like that. And we had gotten some response, but by and large, getting lots of responses and surveys had been kind of difficult for us. Um, and it, it, just, it just took off. The, the, the survey that we gave to say, what features do you want for the next release? All of a sudden there was just a massive kind of impor or swelling of interest. And, and so we just got all of this great community feedback. So when we surveyed for what features you would like to see in the software, um, you know, we essentially framed it as um, three questions. So what, what do you need before you could move to Island or A? What, what do you consider to be a barrier or a blocker for you to migrate in? Um, what, what features do you just not care about whatsoever? And then what features are, you know, like, oh, that'd be nice, you know, but um, you don't absolutely have to have it. So sort of like, you know, yes, no, and ambivalent, right? Um, and so we essentially, you know, threw out this smattering of features. It was a open community process. So like kind of the tag kind of started the list, but then it got passed around to everyone else. And there was a Google Doc that went and it got a lot of, you know, visibility and stuff like that. And then all of that was essentially turned into this, these lists of features. And then you could, you know, check, you know, yay, nay, or meh for, for each feature, right? So we had 76 total responses, which is very big for us, you know, out of a community of 
I guess at the time when we did that, we weren't even at the 300 installation mark yet. You know, we weren't sure. So, you know, 76 total responses out of some a total that's edging near 300. Like that's a pretty good chunk to get back from engagement. And so we found out here's kind of the top 10. You know, I'm not gonna um, go through each of these here one by one, but you can see the heavy hitters. You know, some of them I've already mentioned, they're part of Islandora now, page content, the IPMH, OCR, stuff like that. Some of these things were mentioned earlier and, um, you know, Francesca and Natalie were talking about it. You know, web accessibility is, is a huge thing. Dealing with mods is a huge thing, right? Um, and so, and also I'll just add dockerization there at the bottom. Although it was the smallest at the time, um, after the 1.1.0 release and the upgrade path and everything that we had to go through, all of a sudden that, that started to become a, a bigger priority, um, not just for everyone else in the community, but also for us at the, at the foundation. So um, fortunately, so it was kind of like, you know, we all knew that everyone needed these things, right? We made this list and everything like that. And we all kind of guessed at what would be kind of the top. We all knew people probably wanted page content and stuff like that. But we were, I mean, just floored by once we had highlighted that common need, once we had pointed out, hey, these are like, you know, these things are the things that people want. It was very easy to actually develop and follow through and deliver those features. And all we had to do was just kind of clear the air and make sure everyone was on the same page. And, then, uh, you know, all of a sudden, bam, all this stuff just starts happening. So we ran sprints for page content, and that's how page content happened and the OCR derivatives. Um, but then a lot of other things just sort of, you know, happened. We didn't have to write a sprint, but one person was starting on something and said, hey, I'm working on this. And, you know, someone else would kind of join in and tag team. And then what do you know? You get a feature. You know, um, and, and so really it just is really, uh, I don't know, heartwarming, I guess, is the, is the word I'm looking for. To see that this is a process that um, works, that we can survey the community, that they will give us that feedback that is also valuable. And then all of the concerned parties are actually willing to jump into action to make it a reality. Like, I mean, really it's fantastic. That's how open source works. And we're very fortunate to have a community that's strong enough for this model to really work. Um, I went to DrupalCon last week, went in quotes, I mean, at my desk. And, and the, the keynote, the Dries note, you know, was really all about what I'm talking about right now. Like this, this pattern of surveying, the community and then using that to set the development priorities to kind of set the technical roadmap and then following through on that, you know, that's what the Drupal community has been doing for a while and they can afford to do that because they're really big and they've really got all that, that mind share and that collective effort. And we're just now starting to get to the point where this is all really possible for us, um, which is just fantastic. So, okay, here is our timeline. In general, we released Islandora 8.1, 1.1, we are now here, and we're talking about what we're going to put into 1.2.0. And we know that soon, sometime down the line, Islandora 9 is going to happen. And when that happens, we'll reset the semantic versioning, so to speak. Um, but that will just be like the next, the next feature. But, you know, we are here, and so what we want to do is we want to try it again. We want to do this whole process all over again. So I have for the past several weeks, months, been passing around a document, you know, started by the tag and passed around again to everyone else. That same thing. The board has seen it. The coordinating committee has seen it. The committers have seen it. Most contributors have seen it, you know, um, but maybe you haven't. Okay. And so if you haven't, I've got the current survey choices that we've got linked here in the slide. So you can, you can check that out if you're, if you're interested in that. But what we're going to do is we're going to try one last exercise to improve that document. So after this, we're going to break out. Well, we're going to have a break. But then after the break, we're going to break out into breakout rooms. And we want everyone to discuss what they think are their 
top three priorities for Islandora moving forward. Okay, and you can again, you can look at that if you want at the at the survey. But we're, what we're looking for here is either a are these features that come back from everyone from this feedback, are they the same ones we've got? Because then there's some confirmation there. But really what I'm looking for, because we kind of get, once you read that document, you may be quote unquote, like kind of tainted and, and, and you might be influenced, right? We want to look for some things that might not be there. So if there's anything not on this document, we would, we're extremely interested in that as well. Because sometimes it just kind of, you know, goes around in the circles and, and we're all just kind of saying the same thing. And so, you know, we just need to maybe break the echo chamber up a little bit. Okay. Um, so that's, that's kind of what we're going to do next with the rest of our time here for, for the online conference today. So uh, again, I'll just, and Melissa will, you know, shepherd everyone gracefully as she always does.